So my name is John Scott. I'm uh, the Open, Open Technology Development Team Lead. So this is a little project within DoD that we've, uh, we've started around using uh, open source technology. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of describe that. And there was supposed to be a picture up there, but I guess, I don't know why. Pretty sad. So uh, just kind of the, first my disclaimer, um, you know, I'm not a government employee. Um, this is not US government policy. Um, you know, we're working on ideas to hopefully make it that way, but uh, it's not right now. And all the mistakes and opinions are mine. I say this to cover my ass. <laughs> um, so I, I, just a quick story of you know, why, why this is important to, to DoD and national security writ large. Um, some of the folks I work with work on a lot of uh, open source geospatial tools. And you know, actually, if you, if you went next door, you'd hear a little bit more about that in the, the whirlwind talk. Um, but this, this project specifically happened. So when, after Katrina went through, um, NOAA flew a new camera around the, the Gulf region, took something like about 5,000 pictures. And the problem was they had all these pictures. They had the uh, you know, geo coordinates for when they were taken. But then they were just sitting in a directory. This is like, I think, 24 hours after Katrina hit. It just had this massive directory of pictures, and no one was knowing what to do with it beyond you kind of go through, you kind of figure out where you were, but there's no automated way of doing this. And so with a fellow co colleague of mine, Mark Lucas, who actually helped write the OTD rep our report, he uh, runs this program called Awesome, which is open source, open source software for imagery and mapping. And it's a raster-based tool for doing um, you know, just rapid, rapid processing of imagery. And they were able to take that imagery and within, 24, within 48 hours after cranking through a supercomputer, they were able to, had, able to create the sensor model for the camera and then you know, geofuse all this data together to basically get an entire collage of, of the map of the Gulf, Gulf Coast region within, within 72 hours after that. And so th that, that's pretty powerful stuff. And if you, if you sat down within, in, in a government environment and said, we need to create this capability, it'd probably take you three years to do it. But you know, in this way, it took three days. Basically, a bunch of people hanging out on IRC coming together really to kind of crank this, this stuff through. And uh, you know, coincidentally, how, how many people saw the imagery of Katrina, I guess, you know, about a week afterwards on Google Maps? They had the slider bar. You kind of go backwards and forwards and before and after. So all that imagery actually was given to NASA Whirlwind. And then that imagery was then, was then poured over to Google. So actually, all the imagery, imagery you saw was from this project that, you know, coincidentally, actually, no one ever got paid for. It wasn't something that anybody expected to get paid for, the, the community just came together to basically create this capability on the fly. And because the tools were open enough that they were able to create new sensor models and fuse it and do the analyzation in a batch mode, they were able to really create something really unique in a very short period of time. And so I think this is really what the power you know, of the open source community is, not necessarily the technology, but the community coming together around the needs of a capability area. Um, you know, after they finished this, the, the, another, question, another question came up from the Navy was basically, well, you know, we don't know where our people are, civilian or, or military alike. They were all, you know, a lot, a lot of families were missing, people weren't there, and so the Navy was like, <coughs> saying, well, where are our people? So what they did was they took a lot of that imagery and then basically just fused it with where, where everybody live, where did everybody live in the, in the Gulf region, so that they could then send out um, search teams to basically just go and look at people's houses and say, you know, well, where, where's, where's the, the Navy family as a whole and how are they doing? And so basically this was within I think about seven days after Katrina hit that they were actually able to send people out and just start checking off the boxes for um, you know, the Navy as a whole to figure out you know, how are our people and what are they doing. And you know, just, just a further example of you, know, you, you couldn't plan for something. You could plan for it now, but in terms of how planning goes in the government, if you plan for it, it'd take you about two or three years to do this. And so this is really you know, the agility to respond to crises um, and to opportunities is really what I think the community, the open source community really brings to um, DOD and the government at large. <clears throat> so now we're going to a little bit of you know, my specific domain, which is uh, Department of Defense. Um, there's this new thing out there, and if everybody's heard it now because of the war, uh, network-centric warfare. Um, and so you know, the systems are really being developed basically with industrial area or, or organization and processes. Um, you know, the idea is that uh, you know, if, you build a if you know how to build a tank, you should know how to build a software system. And so a lot of the requirements, processes are re requirements and acquisition processes are set up, um, as we've heard this morning, is, I guess the same as state governments are to how, how do you build and buy hardware um, and design hardware. And so that, that's, that's probably the biggest problem that we're running into with, with software. A lot of the software, a lot of DOD software policies haven't been updated in about 10 years, 15 years. So, you know, and, you know the increasing complexity of code. Um, you know, also another problem that DOD has is they spend about $40 billion a year on you know, new technology development. You know, a big chunk of that is software. A lot of it's basically, you know, it's not much of it is reused across various programs or across the, the Navy or the services. Um, there's lots of interoperability issues. 
Um, there's constant reinvention of code. Um, if you have a friend of mine who works radar systems, he's like, you know, how often do we just create, keep creating new code to move a cursor on the screen for radar tracking? He's like, we do it every time, and it keeps, you know, and so there needs to be some standardization of this stuff, and it's not really happening. Um, and also, really, it's the development and maintenance costs that really outweigh deploying systems. That's, that's where a lot of the cost really is. It's not getting the system out there. It's maintaining it, operating it, upgrading it. And really, it's, you know, we, need, we need timely delivery of new solutions, especially when you're fighting with information. So this is really about the acquisition system and the development model. Feel free to interrupt me as well. You have a lot of time. So as I said before, the, the requirements process and the acquisitions process is, too, is way too long for software and information systems in, in DOD and government. Um, and the needs in the field aren't being addressed, aren't, aren't being addressed in time to have, have an impact. And the cost, cost, if you look at the GAO did a recent study about uh, information technology systems and everyone was over budget and it was all because of software. Um, every single one of the major weapon systems were over, over cost because of software. And you know, it's, it's a bill that I think we as a country can absorb for a little while, but after a while you have to start asking yourself, you know, what are we doing wrong here that every big system we're building is you know, 20, 30, 40 percent, 120 percent over, over cost, over budget. And I think that a lot of systems that end up getting used and put out in the field, they're really to get the, they end up being used to get the job done versus by the book. So no matter how you create technology, innovation is always inevitable, especially when you put it in the hands of the end user. Um, and I think with a lot of people, you know, there's a lot more coding to be done out in the field, hacking of code and things like that. And so being able to let people do that um, when they're actually using it is a really important thing. <clears throat> So this is nothing new. Um, I think if you, if you go back and you look at a lot of the way the technology, technology was developed in the old days, in the old days, I say, you know, 1950, um, if you go back and read any of the books about Lockheed Skunk Works and how they put together airplanes, um, they just sat down, they said, you know, we're going to steal the avionics from this platform, we're going to, you know, borrow the, uh, the wheels from this place, and then they're really going to put their money in development into new technologies and development of new, of new technologies and ideas versus trying to rebuild everything each time. And you know this model worked great for hardware. We really understand. I don't think that, from an acquisition point of view, we really understand the model of how do you buy digital, yet. You know, so I think we just need to get back to you know beg, bar, you know beg, borrow, steal, and then buy or develop technology. Versus we don't have to go out and buy everything from everybody. We really need to get into how, how do we, you know, use the open source community to to, to what we can do. <coughs> So talking about uh, the open technology development concept specifically, it's really, it's not about technology, it's really about the collaboration among the communities within DoD around technology, um, you know, around very specific ca technology capabilities. Um, things like radar systems, things like uh, logistic systems, RFIDs, um, areas that really cut, cut horizontally across the entire DoD mission area, across all the services, you know. So we, we have three, you know, three focuses. One is, uh, you know, one is basically looking at you know this open data philosophy. Um, you know, it, it's your data. If it goes into an application, you should be able to get it out. You shouldn't have to basically pay the toll keeper every time you pull it out. Um, and this goes for to, you know to things like GIS systems, where you know there's a lot of proprietary formats out there, and the switching costs become so high that no one switches. Or if you do, it's it's a pretty massive bill. Um, it, it, as well as also, also part of this is defining and making open avail openly available standards um, interface. There's been some issues and problems around RFID tags. Um, active RFID tags currently. Um, and the, the, the second, uh, second policy, which is more around what, what this conference is about, is you know, what, what's the policy space around how DoD can interact with the open source software community? Um, things like what's, what is uh, defining what uh, software distribution means within, inside DoD? Um, you know, the fact that government, government uh, employees can't hold a copyright for their work. Um, there, there, there are some legal and policy issues that aren't, don't exist there for the federal government that are easier for, for companies to deal with. So what's the policy space look like? There, and then also, the, and this is the, probably the, big, the bigger bang for our buck for what we're trying to do is, you know, DoD spends a lot of money on developing technology. Um, how, how do we foster the communities to share that technology across DoD? So if the Army pays for something to be developed, can the Navy then get that software code and, and share it with each other and really foster communities? Um, so it's moving much more towards a joint de development environment. You, you may have heard of a lot of work talk about doing, doing a joint war fighting where you know, the Army will call in a missile strike on something from, an air, from a Navy, Navy or an Air Force plane. You know, this is the same idea, but taken to you know, the extreme of you know, you're actually doing joint development and trying to move that way. And how do you foster the communities around that and collaborate? 
and this was going to require changes and clarifications in policy. Uh, that's just, just um, what we found so far. And I think at the, at the heart of all, everything that we've been talking about uh, today so far is really about letting the best ideas win. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's you know, commercial off the shelf, government off the shelf, you know, free open source software, DoD source, really need to compete on ideas versus lock in. And I think this is the one thing that, that the government really hasn't done a good job at being a good customer, is really examining what the long term implications are of buying a specific technology vendor and really being, you know, being smart with your money. It's what you would do at your own house or, at, or what companies do. They look at what's the best value for themselves. And so really, and, and figuring out how to basically, you know, since industry is the one that's going to drive technology development, this is a good thing for industry as well. And we're working on governance models as well. <clears throat> so I guess really why OTD matters. Um, I think cost is a, is a lesser part for us, for DOD. Cost is, is, a, is a lesser motivator. Um, no one believes you when you say you're going to save money. It just doesn't happen in the government. Um, I think that the, 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 real, the real key here is agility, is really, really being able to, except for in the Katrina example, really being able to create the you know, rapid creation and assimilation of new, new, new capabilities for the warfighter. Um, that's, that's the important thing. Being able to get something out to the field in three months versus three years, you know, that, that, is, that, that is key, especially, especially when you're fighting with information. Um, and, and, and the other part is really transitioning. If you, if you are building in somewhat of an open manner, you know, the architecture is going to be easier to understand, manipulate, or modify. And this, this is a really, t really, especially with a lot of advanced technologies, DOD has always had this problem of wanting to keep its industrial base as big as possible so that you're not locked into one or two vendors. And when you, li when you only license one vendor, you're, you're locked into one vendor. And so then, then it becomes a real issue. So I think that uh, building in somewhat of an open manner can help alleviate some of these you know, software coding technology problems. Yeah, and then you know, cost is one. I think that you know, one is you know, leveraging external, external open source technology investments you know, so that DOD doesn't have to go out and rebuild our operating systems and things like that. <coughs> Pardon. And you know, like I said before, you know, what, do you, what can you beg borrow or steal to basically create your new, your new systems and using the funds for new development? And I think that, that, that's the key part. That's the key part for us. And really, it's about collaboration. Uh, as, a, as a big part of our effort, um, we're doing a lot of work into looking at you know, how, how is software actually purchased in the government? Um, you know, how's it, what, what's the business case? What does copyright, copyright look like? Um, one of the biggest issues we found so far is security. That, that is the number one issue, security um, for deploying software. Um, you know, there are issues around if software was developed in a foreign country, can you use it on, on a military system? I mean, Although a lot of people don't ask, seem to ask a question about Cisco, but it's, a, but it's the same issue around open source, especially when you can see the software code. So that, that's probably the number one issue that we found um, deploying these systems in the government, in DOD. Um, and then also operational test and evaluation, which is the, the means by actually getting these systems out to the warfighter. And then there are, there are some legal issues that we're looking into as well. It's not too clean of an area. Um, but they said before, that, you know, the number one issue is, is for adoption is validation, verification, security, and testing. Um, that, that seems to be the big tripping point for a lot of this stuff, since you don't know for some of these open source projects where, where the codes come from, what's the pedigree of the code. Um, there's a lot of hesitancy to take it through. Things like Linux, you know, Linux and you know, Red Hat and, uh, and IBM have basically taken the code through a validation, a FIPS validation process, so it becomes less of an issue for that. But for a lot of these smaller application projects out there, or things like OpenSSL, um, you know, how do you get those things through and, and you know, how do you build up the trust in the community that this stuff does, really does work? Um, one of the guys I work with, he said the biggest problem with open source is the word open. Um, that that's just, that can be a, a big limiting factor because people are afraid of, of open, especially when you're talking about national security systems because everything is typically closed off and classified and so it's open just sounds like, you know, it is the, the FUD, the communism FUD. So, so we're doing a lot of work around trying to map out the software. You know, this is, we, we, we started this project, we kind of ended up binding off more than we, more than we wanted to. So we, now we're looking at the entire software lifecycle for DOD um, to try and basically help them figure out what the, what the policies might be. If, if, you know, since they haven't updated the policies in 10 years, probably it's about time to start looking at, the, at it. You know, really, and working on education, and industry and government education. And I think that this is where industry really can help because you know, with a lot of this stuff, there's been a number of repositories that have been created at DoD, probably between six and ten, and each one has failed because they've turned into museums of code. They all are focused on, send us your code, we'll put it into a museum, and then people can maybe come use it. 
no one really focused on looking at how do you develop the communities around these software, around these software capabilities. And so that, that's the biggest point. That, that's been our biggest takeaway, is you have to really focus on the people and the communities that, that develop the software, not around the technologies themselves. Because, you know, any communication system will work when, you know, regardless of your organizational structure, any communication system will help you get to where you need to go. So other issues, governance. Um, this is a big part of the trust issue. You know, if, you, if, you are, if you're a government organization using, or a DoD organization using open source software code, you know, there needs to be some, they need to have some sort of trust that if I use this, you know, how do I influence the baseline and move it towards where, I, where I'd like it to go? And so this is, this is one issue we have to lay a lot of, you know, storage for these people. Um, you know, red teaming, code review, um, you know, companies like Coverity and Black Duck, and, you know, using that, you know, underwriter's laboratory type of idea, how do you bring that into, into the industry? And building, you know, code pedigree acquisitions process, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you just, you bite on one thing and it keeps going down. Uh, we have a website that we're, that, we, that we're working on, a big wiki, uh, opentechdev.org, to discuss and contribute, so I'll just throw that out there if you're interested. <coughs> um, that's kind of it for my presentation. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wanted to have more, more questions from you all than uh, me just sitting up here and babbling for, for an hour. So um, we have a report. If you go to uh, you know, acq.osd.mil slash ASC, you can get the, the copy of the roadmap that we came out with. And that's all open up for questions now. Curious, what kind of uh, reception has the report received? It, within, within the building, it's been very positive. Um, there's been a lot of people saying, like, you know, yes. Because I think there, there's a lot of, there, there are a number of uh, reports, initiatives going on looking at software in general and saying, you know, why are we not doing that great a job with software? So it's been, a, it's been a burden that everybody's side for the last 10 years. So anything, anybody, they do a really good job of saying, here's what the problem is, but there aren't a lot of people coming out to saying, here's what the solution is. And coming up with more formal methods of doing design doesn't seem to be helping. So anytime you go to the table with a solution, a lot of people are, everybody seems to have been very supportive of it. So does that help to answer your question? <laughs> Any other questions? Come on. Start the back of the room and go to the front. We got a lot of time to burn here. Uh, do you have a definition of, of, of the open technology term? I'm starting to see it more and more, which, which I like. Uh, when it comes to the, the federal government, there is not that there is a hesitation about open source, but in the federal government, there are a lot of issues of collaboration, not so much. The source, a lot of the source is already public domain, so it's not mm -hmm. an open source issue. What do you have a kind of an official definition of what open technology means? Well, the, the, the slide that I had back here talking about what, what the three, basically it's, you know, open data philosophy. I mean, somebody told me basically you're talking about building it in an open manner. And from that, we, you know, use open source software code, you know, use open, use open source where you need to, um, share, you know, share and collaborate where you have to, and then, you know, you build to some sort of open, open spec or open design. So I think it's kind of a loose definition, we chose it specifically for that reason. Um, but basically it's around, you know, techno you know, collaboration of technology, around, you know, collaboration <coughs> of groups around a specific capability. So, pressure of an open technology, or open collaborative, or something else, but it seemed to work. Hmm? Uh, you mentioned earlier on uh, something that surprised me, that the government can't own a copyright, is that what you said? Government employees can't hold a copyright. Oh, government employees. Government employees can't hold. They can't, they can't create a copyright. The government itself can hold copyright. You can assign the government uh, copyright to your works. Okay. But government employees can't, when they create, you know, when they write paper, it becomes public domain, but it's not copyrighted. As I understand, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but that's what I've been told. And so the, there are some issues when you have people who are actual government employees working on software code, and then how do you, if you want to go to some sort of a GPL or, you know, LGPL or some sort of a copyright license, what's the uh, mechanism to make that happen? And so there are lots of ways where people are working around that, but trying to figure out a way of making it, of changing it. Yeah, Brian? So this is the current status you're waiting for uh, uh, to say this is a good idea to move forward? Okay. What is it, what's the next step? So yeah, so, I, I so the, the next step, so we report came out in April, so we're working on a large project right now that's taking a lot of open source software through Trying to understand all the, you know, the, trying to understand the process for how software gets validated and tested throughout DoD. 
So taking some OS, some operating systems, some, uh, some applications through the process to really understand from you know, the, the ground level of what's, you know, what, what the hell it can be trying to, kind of trying to get these systems validated and verified and, and okay for use across DoD and the intelligence community. So we're basically take, so we're trying to understand that process from the ground up and then figure out, well, you know, for open source software, here are some of the roadblocks. Here's where things really do, really do take years and years to work through. I mean, OpenSSL has gone, has been under, uh, you know, it's been working on open, op, getting OpenSSL validated. It's been taking them three years so far. So um, look, so, so from the ground level, we're trying to get a real, real good view of what that looks like. And so that's starting now. That's probably going to progress for the next year and try to come up with some uh, really good solid recommendations for, for that as well as for policy moving forward. Yeah, I mean, so that, that we're, we're just kicking off a couple projects around a couple, with, with a couple different groups of they want to try and open source their software to just the DoD community. So starting to try and work with them on, we'll just kind of get their code to, to the point of view that they can share it and then work, th work through the issues of copyright and legally and, you know, and how, do you, how do you make that open to, to the industry and to the community and, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want the government running these repositories, you want industry as probably some sort of a consortium running these, running these repositories. So we're, we're just kicking that at, we're, well, probably about a month here, we'll, we'll start that effort off, off with a couple of program offices of trying to push that, those things along, but really trying to work on, you know, every day, how do you really make this stuff happen versus, you know, high level policy talk. Is this yeah. one software? It could be applied to hardware. We haven't started that. I mean, I think that you know, going going out, going down the you know, doing open because there is well, there's movement about open hardware designs and making that available. Um, I don't. We haven't started down that path, but some people have wanted us to. But it's just a matter of our bandwidth and our time. Um, I mean, this is this is pretty much of a, of a shoestring project. We uh, we go around, we get funding from various various offices to kind of look look and review this. And it's it's one of those sad areas where it's. It's everybody's responsibilities, but it's nobody's responsibility. And so we're kind of you know, trying, trying to move the ship slowly and uh, say, hey, there, there's a better way to do some of this stuff. Let's, uh, let's figure it out together. And there seems to be some you know, really good support within, within the building for that. Have you, uh, are you working with other government agencies or other government agencies? We're discussing with uh, GSA and OMB and some of the other uh, outside DOD agencies, but nothing, nothing formal yet. Um, a, lot of, a lot of those, I mean, DOD spends huge amounts of money on this, so that where they go, not that everybody's going to follow, but uh, we, we've started conversations with them, and they, they seem to be pretty supportive of it as well. And the, the, one, the one interesting thing is, when, once we started this project, you know, we, we weren't, you know, weren't naive enough to think that we were the only people doing this, but we've, we found more and more groups were popping up, and everybody thought they were doing something kind of bad or naughty, and they weren't allowed to doing that, or they shouldn't be doing it. And so it's, it's been pretty refreshing to see there are a lot of people who really want to try and do something different and get solutions delivered to, you know, ultimately the taxpayer faster and cheaper. Any other questions? Yeah. You work for Radio Link? Yeah. And so what is your relationship with uh, DOD? So I'm a contractor. So I'm basically a support contractor for this effort. So I, I run the effort. So you're a contractor for your services mm -hmm. with source code well, so I, I'm basically a contractor for this effort specifically. One of the other people, uh, Mark Lucas, who wrote the report with me, he actually runs um, an open source software um, for GIS project. So part, part of my company gets paid to do you know, a customization and integration of uh, open source GIS tools for um, the government, for DOD. How do you reconcile the idea that I mean, with warfare, obviously, you want to be ahead of the other guy Open. You know, if you open it up, then you just give the other other people the same. Thing. Well, first thing we're not we're not saying that you'd you'd want to open everything up. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is I think you really have to sit down and figure out just just like any big company has done is what what's your real competitive advantage here? What what do you really want to you know if you're fighting with information, what's going to be your really what's the one you know, you know a couple dozen different nuggets you really want to fight with? Um, you know, do you really, do you want to make you know, it's not going to be about the OS. It's, I mean, I, I think for DoD, it's really about how you put all these pieces together to make it fly as a coherent whole. And you know, what are those very specific tips and tips, tricks, ideas, and technologies that do that? And so, you're, we're not talking about open sourcing everything. I mean, that that's not at all. I think that 
you know, more the, the DoD source would be more about how do you make that available to everybody within the within the DoD proper development community. And I think that uh, I mean people have brought this idea up to us or question about you know if, if you do this, then the Chinese will know what we're doing. Well, <coughs> Chinese already know what we're doing. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, but I'm, I'm not being flipped, but I think on the, the, the things that are commodity, things that are commodities, I mean, like Linux, Microsoft, Cisco, I mean, all the stuff that we all use, a lot of stuff's being developed overseas as well. So it's not, uh, you know, I mean, or, or in India. So I think you really have to figure out what do you really, what, what is your real competitive advantage um, in warfare? So that's hopefully starting some of that conversation as well. Uh, following up on that, um, what concerns do you have and what Well, and I think that's a bigger, yeah, and I think that's a bigger question than just for open source. I think that's for all software. Um, you know, if you look at, I mean, how complex Windows has gotten, you know, what, how do you know that some coder in it didn't put something in there either? And I think for, for all software in general, it's looking at, you know, well, how do you really do risk mitigation and um, testing and validating software, you know, at the end of the life cycle for what you're going to deliver versus validating the, the formal process for how you got there. And I think that we don't do a good job right now at basically doing risk mitigation of deployed software. You know, I think things like testing. It should be. I mean, whether you get a binary you know, or source code, I mean, if, if you're going to put a, if you're going to put something in, in, if you're a business or you're at home, you know, you, you want to know what, what's going on within that software. And having some sort of a, you know, good housekeeping seal of approval, you know, on the end product to say, hey, this thing's okay, or here's, you know, here's where it falls down, here's where it breaks. You know, I think for all software, that, that, that's an issue, not just for open source. I think open source is great because you can see the source code. I think trying to figure out how to make, you know, how to basically make all software better um, really should be the, the focus on, on all of us, not just uh, for open source. Because proprietary has, has a, definitely has a place you know, in this marketplace. So, we've got about 10 minutes left. We can end or keep.